Uh, welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to see you all. Um, we've got a good, fantastic uh, speaker lined up for today, which I'm very pleased that you could able to join us from the US of A. Uh, we mailed out the last latest issue of the passengers log about two weeks ago, so I hope it's arrived everybody in, in overseas. Uh, Alice, have you got your copy yet? Has the log, the log arrived in Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic so far? In the mind. I like to particularly, particularly well. Not yet, I am sorry. Not arrived yet. Okay, well, hopefully it's been there very shortly. Yes, it takes some couple of weeks, you know. I will let you know definitely when it's here. Okay, thank you very much. I like to particularly well. As to the links, if I can add something, I usually print all uh, these emails with links to the Zoom meetings into a folder in my computer. So I can easily find it then. Okay, great. I'll just mute everybody now so I can make the uh, announcements and things. So let's start the meeting now. So I'd like to particularly welcome our uh, passengers from the Czech Republic, um, Alice Klojubek and Matej Ketakochi. It was early morning their time. We're also expecting a member from the UK to join us, Mark Jones, where it's even earlier in the morning for him. A couple of people from the USA who are going to join us. I don't think they've come in yet. And our guest speaker is uh, Howard Austin from the USA, who is currently uh, away from home and joining us from a hotel. So welcome, Howard. We'll be getting on to you very shortly. In the uh, current news, it's mainly about Netflix at the moment. Um, as you may have heard, Netflix has cancelled uh, season two of The Irregulars, even though it was a success for them. They've cancelled uh, not going forward with it for season two. Anola Holmes 2, the second movie in that franchise, has been announced by Netflix, but we don't have any details yet on which uh, story or which book that the uh, movie will be based on. But it's been hinted that perhaps uh, Henry Cavill, who plays uh, Sherlock Holmes in that uh, movie, might have a bit more to do this time. Uh, Netflix is also reportedly still moving ahead with a movie called Sherlock Jr., which is another young adult movie, this one set in modern times. And the big news, of course, I'd like to announce the winner of our annual Montpellier Award for the best article uh, published in the Passengers Log in 2020. Just to refresh your memory, there were four contenders for the, uh, for the award uh, for 2020. The first was uh, Sherlock Holmes in Tibet by Keith Souter. Uh, there was Nihilists in the Canon by Kerry Murphy. Uh, Some Musings on the Veiled Lodger by James C. O'Leary. And Dr. John Watson, A Man About Town by Michael Duke. And we had about uh, 15 or 20 people uh, send in their votes. So thank you very much for that. And the consensus of opinion, a clear winner is Keith Souter from his uh, article, Sherlock Holmes in Tibet. And Keith uh, gets this award, this trophy. That side, uh, that's our Carol Duke's Montpellier Award trophy. And Keith gets his name engraved as the uh, the latest winner. Down there. Um, Keith also gets a personal award which has been sent to him. He's, uh, he's actually aware of the award. I told him last week about that. So congratulations again, Keith, and very well done. And we look forward to uh, many more historical and uh, political articles like that one. That was, that was fantastic. Thank you. I'm, I'm very honoured to uh, receive the award. As I said to you, uh, um, I'm just a fellow traveller. I just do this out of interest. I'm not like uh, some of the professional writers that we have uh, in the organisation. So I'm very humbled to receive the award. In fact, I have just also now written about uh, Sherlock Holmes in um, Khartoum, um, where he was also part of that great hiatus. So that's the yeah. second phase of this. And that, that's with Erin, um, who's uh, got it in the system, I think. Okay, we'll look forward very much to seeing that article appear in print in the log. Um, I'm going to have a bit of a show and tell. I've got nothing to actually show and tell myself, but uh, William Blackmore, have you got something to tell us? You normally have something interesting news. No? Okay, nothing from Lee. Well, I'll, um, without further ado, yeah. I'll... Can you hear me now? Hello, Lee, there you are. Any uh, yeah, I've show got... and tell from you this time? Got a few books. <laughs> As usual, I could show. All right. Quickly. The floor is yours. A couple of them are old. Well, actually, most of them are old. Um, 
I've got one here that I got hold of recently called An East Wind Coming by Arthur Byron Cover. Um, was published in the 80s, which it's just an entertaining Sherlock Holmes meets Jack the Ripper number, just for fun. One of those, like a study in terror. Um, I got this book, Strange Tales from the Strand, which is an anthology. Um, people people probably know of that one. I was astounded to find that I didn't have it. I thought I had it. But there's also a companion volume by the same editor called Strange, uh, not Strange, Detective T Tales from the Strand. So, um, yeah, they're worth um, hunting down and still get them cheaply sources and um, I've been trying to get some more of my critical section of my library sort of organized so I got this one on the scent with Sherlock Holmes by Walter Shepard and um, that contains a number of essays by that guy such as the Musgrave Muddle and others that's very entertaining and um, just quickly I won't go on for too long but People might know that I'm a big fan of the Solar Ponds uh, pastiches, which were originally written by August Derleth, and there's been a long history um, of those. But um, the, the, just as there is the Baker Street Irregulars, there's, for the Solar Ponds, there's the Prade Street Irregulars, and they used to issue this magazine called the Pontine Dossier. That's an issue from the 70s. And then it went through online for a while, but now they're putting out this new edition called the Pontine Dossier also in a book form. And that's for um, when you can't get enough homes, there's always solar ponds to turn to. And <laughs> I got this other thing, which is um, Basil Popper, who was one of the authors who wrote some solar ponds adventures, The Adventure of the Singular Sandwich, little limited edition short story all fun my games okay thank you very much for that uh, lee is anybody anybody else got any more interesting little things they picked up with yeah. the other, other members bill i'll throw one out there for you it's um when he mentioned jack the ripper one of his uh pastiches there there's quite a bit of them been out lately quite a few the russian series Sherlock Holmes in Russia, which uh, episode one was available with English subtitles, but not the rest because it was being streamed in Russia, has now been sold to a German outfit and Netflix, I believe, and will be coming out soon. And their first two episodes are Jack the Ripper episodes. I've seen them because I have a Russian girlfriend and she translates them for me. And uh, I really like the interpretation of the Maxim Mativ, the Sherlock Holmes. He's, he's very good. It's, it's a little more, um, perhaps a little more gory and sexy in parts, but I mean, it's really a good series. It's going to be, uh, keep an eye out for that. It's coming out finally where we can see it with English subtitles. Yes, I also saw the announcement that that had been sold to an outfit in ZDF, I think they're called, to uh, market. Yes. Well, so looking very much forward to that coming to our screens with English subtitles. I was also seen the, I was in the first episode and also I was impressed with it as well. So. I'm eagerly looking forward to the rest of the rest of the series. That leads me into introducing our guest speaker for today, Howard Ostrom, who you just saw on the screen, is our guest speaker coming to us from a hotel in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Howard describes himself as a Sherlock Holmes media pundit. He maintains the A to Z list of Sherlock Holmes performers, which is approaching 7,000 entries. And he is the uh, co-author of the Sherlock Holmes Cyclopedia book series which details all screen appearances of Sherlock Holmes since 1900. Well, volume three was due out uh, last year, but that got held back because of the pandemic. So fingers crossed it'll be coming out uh, in the very near future. After Howard's talk, he'll be very happy to take any questions from anybody. And he will be talking about uh, the very first appearance of Sherlock Holmes on stage, a new one he's just discovered, which make it, makes it the new first one. Plus he'll also be talking about some early Australian performers who, who, who played Holmes on stage in this country. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Howard and let him have, a, have the floor. Thank you, Howard. One second, we'll see if we can get it set up like I had it. 
and we'll work on it from there. You can disregard the notes at the right. Those should be on a piece of paper on my right side, but they're sitting in Florida still. So that's some notes I scribbled to make up for what I left in Florida. And I'll start out with this. Let's see, I gotta get this out of the way. Okay. Your first slide there says, who's on first? It's not so elementary, which is now commonly referred to as Around the World with Sherlock Holmes. It was the name of an essay I wrote perhaps 10 years ago. It was not written to lay claim to the fact that these are the very first Sherlock Holmes performance for a particular country, but they are simply the earliest performance our research has uncovered. We present this essay with the hope that its readers would supply me with more information on the subject for their countries. And it worked, as it's now in its fourth revision and the number of countries included in it has gone from 35 in its initial writing to 95. 95 countries are now represented with 235 performers documented. In today's presentation, we'll be discussing new recent stage finds for Great Britain and the United States, which will dispute previously better known performance or until now have often received credits as such. Plus for Australia, this is the Sydney Passengers and Friends, correct? Is that right? That's right. Yep. Good. <laughs> I don't want to present this to the wrong group. We will highlight five very early Australian-born Sherlock Holmes performers, as well as two of the most popular early Australian performers who actually were born in Canada and New Zealand. We start with Charles Hallam Elton Brookfield, better known as Charles H.E. Brookfield, who, if any of you have researched Sherlock Holmes on stage or anything like that, he's credited as the first in anything you read. He played Sherlock Holmes on the London stage and under the clock, 1893 to 1894. He was born in London, which made him, according to everybody, the first ever Sherlock Holmes in any medium and first Englishman to play Sherlock Holmes until, the, until this essay is out. November 1893, the month before Sherlock Holmes supposedly fell to his death uh, at the end of the adventure, the final problem, saw the character make his debut on stage in Under the Clock, a one-act mu one musical satire, which opened on the 25th of November at the Royal Court Theatre in London, forming part of a triple bill. The play was written by Charles Brookfield and Seymour Hicks, who would also portray Holmes and Watson respectably, albeit with a strange choice of wardrobe. Holmes wore black tights and supported a full beard, while Watson's apparel included a monocle and a pirate's cap. Uh, you like that one? The play in its satirical note, which was merely used as a front to throw mocking asides at certain members of the acting establishment, was given short shrift by the reviewers, as well as Sir Arthur Conan, Del Arthur Conan Doyle himself, who attended it. Despite this, the play achieved 78 performances before the curtain fell for the final time on the 25th of January, 1894. Now, enter Charles Denley to the fray. The Wheel of Time by T.B. Bannister was played for the first time on December 26, 1892 at the Theater Royal in West Bromwich. In it, Charles Den Denley plays a character described as a capital detective named Sergeant William Fellows. However, in 1893, the show receives a rewrite, and it's noted in this clipping from the papers, with George Comer's name now added to the authors. Uh, and we'll assume he did these revisions. In the revision, Sergeant William Fellows' name has been changed to Sherlock Fellows. I'll get that for you next. See, there's a clipping there where now he's listed as Sherlock Fellows. This opens debate as to Charles Brookfield or Charles Denley, the first Sherlock Holmes performer on stage. My opinion after reading numerous clippings uh, tilted me towards Tom, Charles Denley as the choice. Another Charles Rain takes over the role of Sherlock Fellows in 1894 
But in 1895 and 1897, Rain returned for two brief revivals of the Sherlock Fellows character, and it, his name had been transformed back to Captain Fellows, Deputy Governor of Dartmoor Penal Settlement, and Sergeant Clifford. The significance for me of these is Charles Denley appears as Sherlock Holmes, as Sherlock Fellows, in May and June 1893, which predates. Charles Brookfield as Sherlock Holmes and Under the Clock, which was first performed November 25th, 1893. Clearly in this revision of the original play, George Comer borrowed what by then was a household name to lend his detective more dramatic topicality. He was the first and certainly not the last to do so. The dropping the, dropping the Sherlock reference after 1894 and in 1895 and 97 revivals by changing the name, uh, parallels the waning of public interest post Reichenbach, or perhaps this could have been due to a Doyle protest that we are unaware of. I couldn't find any notes on that, but that's a distinct possibility too. Since there's no evidence in the review of a fully fledged Sherlock Holmes burlesque, we are not debating the significance of the wheel of time versus under the clock to Sherlockian lore, only the significance of the character name. Do we drop the first designation from Mr. Brookfield now? What say you? Okay. Now we're going to swap over to the United States. I'm sure you all recognize this fellow. 1899, William Gillette, who lived 1853 to 1937. This show is perhaps technically not the first, second, or third American Sherlock Holmes. He certainly was the best known and most influential stage Sherlock Holmes. Following his copyright performance in England, Sherlock Holmes debuted, uh, debuted October 23, 1899 at the Star Theater in Buffalo. From 1899 to 1932, he performed Sherlock Holmes on stage approximately 1,300 times, which other than H.A. Sainsbury, who did it a little more in England, is uh, more than anybody else by a mile. Often while performing other popular demand, including him to add at least one extra performance to Sherlock Holmes. The Jet Sherlock Holmes play was nearly influential in inducing the character Sherlock Holmes to a worldwide audience as the Conan Doyle stories were. That's the whole significance, by the way, in media, why I write so much about media, is that without media, without the plays and without the movies, Sherlock Holmes might have gone away of a lot of other detectives who just faded from literature, from future writing of literature, which we all can attest to by the number of pastiches and TV shows and everything. Uh, it's not going to happen to Sherlock Holmes. Um, of course, William Gillette's portrayal of the Sidney Pageant illustrations helped to create the modern image of the detective, we know. But who was the first American Sherlock Holmes performers? Well, here's my dilemma. You can choose between perhaps four or five of the following, depending on your parameters. I'll start with this one. Let's see. Now there's Mr. Gillette again, one of the famous lithographs. Here's Gillette with some nice color photos I threw in. I love William Gillette, by the way. They have William Gillette Festival in North Carolina every year. I've been to his castle. It's a wonderful, wonderful guy, very creative. Now, here's a poster that was sent to me, an 1896 poster. Now, I, I can't remember, I should, I can't credit the guy who sent it to me right now. I believe it was Adrian Barnett from Malaysia. But he said, you mean to tell me there was a Sherlock Holmes way back here, 1896, prior to Gillette? And he sent me this poster, so I had to research the poster. And you can see it says, Sherlock's bold defiance. You kick me and I'll holler, holler bloody murder. And the character's name, uh, let me see what I wrote on here. Uh, the actor's name who played the part in 1895 and 96 was Charles T. Aldridge. And the actual writer of the play, Scott Marvel, in 1899, played the character Buttons McGurk, AKA Sherlock Buttons, in the stage production of the Sidewalks of New York on Broadway. Uh, Aldrich premiered the road tour in 1895, and then on Broadway in 1899, Scott Marvel took over the part. 
Uh, it, the play was a melodrama dealing with the love of a man and faithfulness of a woman through rough and adverse circumstances in early New York. There was larceny, defamation, burglary, a killer, and retribution. One of the featured characters, Buttons McGurk, had read the Sherlock Holmes stories and ordered his crony, Raphael, better known as Craps, only which would be the Watson version in this play, to only call him Sherlock starting in Act 3 from then on. For the rest of the play, he decided to start a detective agency to solve a murder and get rewards. Now, who exactly was Charles T. Aldrich? Let's see if we got, I have another poster here. This one, their label is Two Tenderloin Sleuths, Thurlock Buttons and Craps. And this was all the characters in the play in the top left of that, you'll see Sherlock Buttons and Craps. Uh, let's see. Now, whoops, hold on here. I don't see Mr. Aldridge. Oh, no, no. Somehow Mr. Aldridge got left out of the, got left out of the slides. Well, Charles T. Aldridge was the first American Sherlock from the road productions of the sidewalks in New York City. He was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1869. He was a comedian who appeared in the vaudeville circuit. His act consisted of being chased around the stage and was pursued by a red handkerchief. That must have been exciting. He was also known as a magician, quick change artist. Many, of, many considered him America's top quick change artist. In 1901, he became a Broadway actor, uh, appearing in a play produced by Charles Froman uh, called The Girl From Up There at the Herald Square Theater. Well, you know, Charles Froman from William Gillette, his agent. In 1918, he appeared in uh, everything, a show included Harry Houdini. Uh, let's see what else. He returned to Vaudeville with the, around 1904. He married an actress, Gloria Gordon, and they had a son who they named Charles T. Aldridge Jr., but also changed his name when he became an actor. His adopted mother's surname and called himself Gail Gordon. You may remember Gail from his many roles in radio and television. Gail Gordon was the first actor to play first Flash Gordon on radio in 1935 but is most famous for his roles as Mr. Mooney on The Lucy Show and Mr. Wilson on Dennis the Menace. Charles Aldrich passed away in New Jersey at 1955 at the age of 86. I don't have this slide here though. No, we'll hold up there. And Scar Marble, Marble, who wrote the play, besides being a playwright, it would appear, assumed the role of uh, Buttons McGurk, Sherlock Buttons for the 1899 Broadway premiere. Scott Marble, uh, died in 1919, da, 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 blah, blah, blah. Oh, another tie-in to Scarp Marble with the uh, Sherlock world is he remembered, uh, his obituary claimed he were, will be remembered as the original Sherlock Holmes in Sides of New York. Uh, he wrote the stage melodrama, The Great Train Robbery, 1896. The Edison Phil Company made the classic Western movie, The Great, Team, Great Train Robbery in 1903. It was the first film for a young actor named Gilbert M. Anderson. Gilbert M. Anderson would become the first credited Sherlock Holmes actor in Vitagraph Films, Adventure of Sherlock Holmes in 1985, and then go on to be co-founder of SNA Film Manufacturing Company, where he became the biggest cowboy star at silent film era, Bronco Billy, and SA Film Company also made the William Gillette Sherlock Holmes. Now, next up, if you don't like Sherlock Buttons or Buttons McGurk as a choice for a Sherlock, for a Sherlock Holmes in a stage in the United States, let's see. Aha, uh -huh. wait a second here. Oh, they're a little out of order, but the Americans are in here. This was my first try at the keynote. So a little of my notes are a little wacky here, but let me get back here. Still don't see old Mr. Aldridge, but. Okay, this will help here, this, this. Okay, one, two. Hmm. 
Mm, sort them somewhere here they are. Okay. Next we have 1896 and 97. John Johnny Page and Neil McNeil. Since we have John Page, you'll see, and if you can read that, it's kind of old news clipping. It's kind of blurry. Johnny Page had the name Sherlock, and Neil McNeil had the name Holmes in an 1896 stage production called Henrik Hudson, Henry Hudson Jr. Uh, I don't know if we can call this a dead heat with the next person named Ferris Hartman who had the whole name Sherlock Holmes, but we did have a Sherlock and a Holmes in that play. In 1899, Ferris Hartman, there he is. 1899, Ferris Hartman might have honors as the first ever American Sherlock Holmes stage if we dismiss Page and McNeil and Sherlock Buttons there. Uh, Ferris Hartman took to the stage as Holmes on April 24th, 1899 to play The Man in the Moon. This means he preceded the legendary William Gillette as an American stage Sherlock Holmes by nearly six months. New York theor theor theoretical impresario, George Ledger produced The Man in the Moon. It was a musical, basically, blah, blah, blah. Part ballet, part woman in lingerie. The Man in the Moon featured both Sherlock Holmes and Arthur Conan Doyle's characters, with Conan Doyle, for a reason that is difficult to fathom, affecting a Dutch accent. Before going on tour, the Man in the Moon ran 182 performances in New York. Not bad, but the real blockbuster was, of course, Gillette's play. And that takes us, well, get out of America and get to Australia, which is our point in discussing some of the early Australian Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Australia has a rich stage history of Sherlock Holmes productions going through my A to Z. I have more than a couple hundred Sherlock Holmes actors listed for Australia. And let's look at the earliest that we could find. Uh, now I know Bill Barnes and I discussed this years ago and we had an O.P. Hagee actually at the time as a Australian born Sherlock Holmes, but since then we've discovered more. And let's see if we can go up here. Not Cardin Wilson, we want aid of it. Okay. Uh, recently discovered is uh, as far back as 1898. Mr. A. Devitt is possibly the earliest Australian uh, portrayer of Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Devitt played the role in the convict play, His Natural Life, performed 9th of November, 1898. Having once been a Brit British penal colony, I guess it's only appropriate that Mr. Devitt played the role of a convict in the play. At least Sherlock Holmes was a sentry and not, a, not exactly a convict. I don't have any more than this one article on, uh, which doesn't tell me a ton on that play, but that dates from 1898. And one would assume he was uh, Australian. I can't prove that. Let's see. Okay. The Gillette Sherlock Holmes tour of Australia in 1902 has been thoroughly discussed in the blog, Australia's First and Second Sherlock Holmes by Dr. Durnham Groves of the University of Melbourne, uh, dated January 3rd, 1911. So I'll give Plummer from New Zealand and Hastings, Kyler Hastings from Canada, a short mention and recommend you read Professor Groves' blog for detailed information on them so we can proceed with the actual native born Australian Sherlock Holmes performance. Um, Henry, Harry Plimmer was born in Wellington, North Island, and his grandfather, John, was one of the city's founders known as the father of Wellington. Harry Plimmer played Holmes in Perth and Adeline. What is that? Ad Ad I'm not good on pronunciation of that one. In uh, J.C. Williams' production of uh, Gillette Sherlock Holmes. To bring Sherlock Holmes to Australia in 1902, Impresario J.C. Williamson had to pay the biggest price ever previously paid for any dramatic or musical play in this country. Williamson hoped that Gillette would tour Australia and play the part of Holmes, but his big success, due to his big success in London, prevented him from coming to Australia, as it had been hoped for. The play opened at the Theatre Royal in Perth, Western Australia, on 26 of July 1902. The principal players were Harry Plimmer, Sherlock Holmes, 
and Lumsden Hare, Dr. Watson. Uh, Canadian actor William Gillette protege, Kyla Hastings also played Holmes in the other Australian state capitals in 1902. Those, those were two very popular uh, playing at Gillette play. They were very popular, could be considered the first, depending on your parameters, they could be considered the earliest Sherlock, true Sherlock Holmes performers in uh, Australia, but not, neither was born in Australia. Let's see what we got next. Not Mr. Hagee yet. Let's see, next we got, okay. J.W. Hoyts, Ho, Ho, Hoyts. I don't know what, how you pronounce that name. I have an article here on him. Uh, 1902 in the Hound of the Baskervilles in Australia. King's School produced a homemade play based on Christy Murray's The Bishop of Amazement after three weeks. But th this year, the idea of utilizing Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Hound of the Baskervilles was conceived in November. The play wrote itself, however, during the next week and then the first rehearsal was on December 1st. In stride of the extreme haste, the result was considerably better than that of last year's play. The first act follows the lines of the books, but a good deal of local color was introduced to the room in Baker Street. The second act was a more which owned its beauty to the Bohemian lecturer, who kindly lent a book cloth to the school buildings, which supplied the uh, Covenant's lair in the shape of a rough home stones. Second act lasted about one minute and represented the rescue of Sir Henry uh, Baskerville from the weird but effective composite book. The fourth act was also quick and lively, and this villain's wife is saved and virtue and Sherlock Holmes accomplished in a wanted victory. So that was a, sounds like a real little quickie in 1902 in Australia, down to the Baskervilles. Well, there's Kyler Hastings. He was a very popular actor uh, in Canada. See, he started in 1900 and all, he did uh, Australia in 1902, but he also did Tasmania, US, Canada. He was very popular. He died, unfortunately, if I remember right, of suicide, like early in, maybe as early as 1912, 1911, somewhere in there. Sorry, man. There's Mr. Plimmer. You'll see lots of photos of him in that Durham Grove reference I gave you. Uh, where did Carden go? No. Here's Carden. Carden Wilson. He, 1904 to 1906, he toured Australia as a mimic, and one of the most popular imitations was that of the aforementioned Ken, Canadian actor Kyle Hastings playing Sherlock Holmes, who toured Australia in the William Gillette play. So, see, Tyler Hastings was so popular over there that he actually had a mimic follow, play him. Now, here's Joseph Mullane. Uh, we discovered him actually when a, a woman, a relative has asked, saw his name in my A to Z or somewhere, sent me a letter asking me for more information on him. And I learned uh, he was born in Australia. He played Sherlock Holmes in the William Gillette play Sherlock Holmes at the Alexander Theatre in Greenock, Scotland, 1909. From correspondence of Margaret McBride, Joseph Mullane's granddaughter, we learned, I never met my grandfather, he was born in Australia, but after some very sad circumstances surrounding a long illness and death of his mother, when he was just 20, he joined up with the Wilson Barnett Company to get away from it all. I think he initially had little or no acting experience, but Barnett took on extras during his Australian New Zealand tour from 1901 to April 1902. Joseph stayed on with him through the tour of South Africa before they finally arrived in England. He continued with the Wilson Barrett Company and took up with my grandmother not long before arrival in the UK, followed with marriage and the birth of a daughter before Wilson Barrett died late in late 1904 and then my own mother's birth year, a year later. The girls saw little of their father or mother. Mabel took to the stage for the first time when mom was four months old, as at least I've noted from playlists to date. Their maternal grandmother took care of girls and toddlers, which they were raised 
in school with a couple of maiden ladies until they were adults where their parents spent most of their lives on the road, traded in the boards. The Joseph Mullane Company performed the speckled band at the Empire in Belfast in June of 1931. Joseph then played Rye Lott to the Shaw Holmes of Julian Courtville. So even if Harry Plummer and Kyler Hastings perform Holmes just play, uh, what I got here, I'll well, see this is an older note before, the paper has been rewrote a number of times, but um, there was a Gillette's play, before Gillette's play that he appeared in, was an obscure Australian actor, J.L. Lawrence played Holmes in The Power of Sherlock Holmes, 1912. So I don't know J.L. Holmes, but uh, Joseph Millane we know was a truly native son. 1909. Thomas Kingston played Sherlock Holmes for the revival of Sherlock, Gillette Sherlock Holmes by the J.C. Williams Company touring troop again. Let's see if we got Thomas Kingston's picture there somewhere. There's Thomas Kingston, some notes on his plays. And finally, o. Oliver Peters Hagee, who Bill Barnes I know wrote something on, I remember reading in your uh, paper. And uh, one time back when we started this paper, this essay out, we believed he might have been uh, Sherlock, the original Australian-born Sherlock Holmes. He played with uh, Claude King as Dr. Watson and Lynn Harding as Dr. Grimsby Roylet in the Speckled Band, an adventure of Sherlock Holmes, under management of Mr. Arthur Hardy in London at the Strand Theatre in February 1911. O.P. Hagee was an Australian film and theatre actor. He was born at Anguston, South Australia, to a local sheep farmer and educated at Wyndham College and the Adeline Conservatory of Music. So even though Harry Plimmer and uh, Hastings performed a play and uh, J.L. Lawrence did the power of Sherlock, uh, he was a native born Australian performer, an early one too. And uh, at the time I put the note in here that Bill Barnes added this bit of O.P. Hagee information. British Provincial and Touring Company Productions, Arthur Hardy's South Company, 1910-1912, the O.P. Hagee as Sherlock Holmes, and Grendon Bentley as Dr. Watson, and E. Vassal Vaughan as Grimsby Roulette. This would appear to uh, indicate Hagee played Holmes as early as September 1910, before he appeared at the Strand, my reference to the Strand in the role. Get rid of this note here. Okay, and what do I got down left here? Oh, who's this? Any of you guys recognize him? No answers? This would be Gary Clark, the most recent in May performance of Sherlock Holmes. I believe right there in Sydney. Okay, now, nobody saw this play? Bill, any of you see this? Quickly booked out, unfortunately. We tried to organize a group uh, to go and see it, but um, all the weekend sessions were booked out in a couple of days, and we missed out. Well, it's a pretty good play, actually, but it's, he plays William Gillette, Sherlock Holmes, in a murder mystery, and it's in William Gillette's castle, and then, of course, Gillette has to ham it up and dress as Holmes as part of the murder mystery. It's an entertaining play. Now, oh, look at this. What's that? We know what that is? It's your book series, Howard. Oh, okay. Uh, everybody has that, so I don't know why I put that on here, I guess. But if you didn't, write down that little uh, address and get yourself one. Because by the time three comes out, you want to have seen one and two. And they take quite a while to read because they're loaded with pictures, believe me. And actually, we base our books you know, everybody has an opinion of every film. If you, if you say the film's the worst, somebody loves it. If you say the film's the best, somebody hates it. So when we did it, we just listed the facts of the films and we put reviews of the times. So the people who actually saw it live and stuff like that, that's what we used. And we didn't use any of our opinions on it. We didn't want to influence anybody. But with so much being discovered now, 
I mean, incredible amounts between streaming and uh, YouTube and a lot of this, probably 75% of this stuff can be watched right now, other than when I bring out the silent film one, that's a lot smaller percentage of stuff to watch, but uh, it's a good source of, and if you look up each of these films, you'll be able to watch a lot of stuff. And this here is the Facebook group, which Bill belongs to, I know a few others may. It's a discussion group. It says Sherlock Holmes on screen is the title because of our book title, but we discuss everything. We throw in plays, we throw out any new news, any new film news, any new, uh, pretty much anything but other new book news because we only advertise our own books. So that's, but uh, we don't talk books that much, but you'll find a lot of weird pictures on there, a lot of interesting stuff. So I hope you guys would join this discussion group if you have Facebook. And that's all I got for you today. Thanks, Howard. It was fantastic. Lots of information. You're obviously a real uh, enthusiast of that particular subject. Uh, I got a question for you. Well, we mentioned that your AIDS list contains around 7,000 entries. How many countries does that represent? Well, we're, we're past 95 countries now. So I do have, um, actually, if anybody on my email address is... My name, Howard Ostrom, at um, gmail.com. Now, I can send the paper with uh, an index and the first Sherlock Holmes paper, which these facts were from, along with all the rest of the countries. To anybody who's interested, I could send a PDF file to them. I have a, a lot of papers, a lot of different essays on Sherlock Holmes, the history in Russia, the history in Poland, the uh, different things. I jumped the, the history of female Sherlock Holmes and Watsons, the history of um, Afro-American Sherlock Holmes and Watsons. I have probably 20, 20 to 30 different papers on different subjects like that. And uh, they were being posted on Ross Fode's uh, No Place Like Holmes website at one time. But since I got into the book deal, the fine print on the book deal says they don't want this stuff posted for people to look at for free until the book series is finished, which sort of ties my hands, but I can still send out to any individual who asks on any subject. I probably have a paper. I have comedian Sherlock Holmes. I have a bunch of different subjects. Um, Sherlock Holmes would have won Oscars. Um, and if there's a subject anybody has a question on, I can forward I can forward the A to Z. It's I'm not allowed to put that out, but I can forward a copy of the A to Z to you. But I'll warn you one thing: when you receive that, it is a long. Uh, there's over fifteen thousand pictures, and it's added to every day. It has now officially gone over seven thousand, and every day I might add five to six new new plays, old plays discovered, old film discovered. Um, anime voices stuff like that and actually i even include uh in some of the zoom meetings and some of the society meetings i got pictures of people dressed as sherlock holmes and cosplay i you know if i got a nice picture from a newspaper or somebody dressed like sherlock holmes to me i have a, a wide band it's just you can determine if it's a sherlock holmes performer or not but for me it is so they're all in there uh, you might be in there yourself, as a matter of fact. You probably are, but <laughs> I think Alex is I in there. When it says it's in the passengers of pay a few years ago, and I think I made it in your listening to course yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah, you are in it. I remember. But it's tough to remember all 7,000 now. I used to know most of them. But if I see the name, I know, you know, I, yeah, I've seen that before. But, um, and it's always constantly changing new additions, some corrections and spelling, some new pictures. People tend to find out and send me pictures of themselves and stuff like that. It's, it's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of work. I mean, it's, so no, I can send you that. Yeah, I can send you that, anybody that, but it's got to be by we transfer because of the size of the file. And it's a PDF and it's, uh, it'll open and show you everything fine, but it takes two, two full uh, we transfer files for me to send it because it's that big. But uh, it's, it's a great reference for if somebody ever says, did so-and-so ever play Sherlock Holmes? You know, I mean, there's people in there you're not going to believe. 
Jean Kelly, for example, take her name. You know, just about any comedian has played. He's, Sherlock Holmes is so popular in parodies and crazy things. Every comedian's got a take on Sherlock Holmes. So it'd be easier for me to name a comedian who's not in the A to Z, because most of them are in there. You know, take Rodney Dangerfield, take anybody. Uh, Laurel and Hardy, yeah, they're all in there. They've all played dressed as them, at least, and clowned around, you know. So, uh, and, and some Australian comedians, too. I don't remember their names, but uh, is it Armstrong, one of them. Uh, there's a few in there. So anybody interested in that, just drop me an email. And I usually get back to you within a day or two. I'm pretty good on that. So. Thank you. Thanks for the offer, Howard. Um, you, want sure you must have a network of correspondents all over the world who send you snippets of information for things that yeah. in your local media. Are there any countries in the world that surprise you with a, a Sherlock Holmes performer, something you never thought you'd ever find out about? Oh, God, now there is. I mean, because there's new countries that I've never heard of. <laughs> I, I, you know, there's a Sherlock, a Sri Lanka, Sherlock Holmes Society who contacts me. There's a, uh, I don't know, Vietnam, uh, the Sherlock Holmes Vietnam. There's uh, those countries in Europe that change their name and I suddenly got to go from... Uh, Croatia to Slavia and Crovinia, whatever it's going on. I mean, there's all sorts. It's 95 different countries. That's the easy paper. It's about 135 page, 137. So, and it's got an index on the front. As a matter of fact, I can call that up right now and I'll show you this index in, uh, not that one. Yeah, that's the paper, let me see. Uh, okay, I'll give you a quick, well, it's 95 of them, but I have England, USA, Albania, Algeria, Argentina, Armenia, Australia, Austria, Azerbaijan, Bangladesh, Belarus, Belgium, Bermuda, Brazil. Brazil is really popular lately. There's a lot of, Brazil and Argentina have big groups. Bulgaria, Burma, Canada, Chile, China. China, uh, the Far East right now, due to the fact that Cumberbatch visited there and the Downey films were so popular there, they're putting out stuff like crazy. Um, Japan, China, and, and I have connections in all those places, and uh, South Korea are just crazy out putting out stuff right now. There's an excellent Sherlock Holmes, probably the best quasi-Holmes, I'd call. Like, I always like the series Monk for a quasi-Holmes for an example, or Psych, or one of those. But it's called Detective L. It came out in 2019 in China, and it's phenomenal. It's on YouTube. I really like that. And that's China, and uh, Hong Kong. And um, what was the other one? Oh, let me read some more. There's Colombia, Commonwealth of the Bahamas, Croatia, Cuba, Cyprus, Czechoslovakia, um, Denmark, Egypt, Estonia, Falkland Islands. How's was that one? I would have never guessed that. <laughs> Finland, France, Germany, West Germany, Ghana, Greece. Uh, Grogan Gen, I put in there because Grogan Gen, <clears throat> there were actually plays performed during the war in the uh, camps, in the uh, prisoner of war camps. And uh, I don't really have a country that I had, like that would happen to be in Holland, I believe, but. Uh, then I have Holland, Hungary, Iceland, India, Indonesia, Ireland, Israel, Island of Man, Italy, Japan, Kazakhstan, Kry, Kryzestan. I see what I, there's countries I don't even know what they are. Laos, Lat Latvia, Lithuania, Malaysia, Mexico, Moldova, Myanmar, New Zealand, North Sea. That that was actually done on a warship, the play. So I, I had to list that as a country, the North Sea, I don't know. But uh, Northern Ireland, Norway, Pakistan, Peru, Philippines, Poland, Portugal, Puerto Rico, the Queen Mary II at sea also was holding plays. Uh, Romania, Ruleben, that's another uh, prisoner of war camp. Russia, Scotland. Serbia, Siam, Singapore, Slovakia, South Africa, South Korea, Spain, Sri Lanka, Saudi Arabia, Sweden, Switzerland, Tahiti, Taiwan, Thailand, 
Trinidad and Tobago, that's a good one, Tunisia, Turkey, Ukraine, United Arab Emirates, Dubai, Uruguay, Venezuela, Vietnam, Wales, and Zimbabwe. So, I mean, Africa is not covered too heavily, but he is everywhere. The man is everywhere. Uh, the South Koreans, for example, nowadays, the boy bands is a big popular thing in, in South Korea. And they had a group maybe 10 years ago called Shiny Sherlock that had a big hit, was huge on YouTube. It's, a, it's an interesting video where they do like a Sherlock Holmes bit. But all the boy bands have followed that. And a lot of the, the girl uh, bands in Korean pop, K-pop as they call it, they all like to dress as Sherlock Holmes. So I got tons of pictures in A to Z of South Koreans dressed as Sherlock Holmes. So it's crazy. It's a big world. I know that was a long answer, but that's what you get from me. I'm sorry. That was fascinating. Uh, it surely uh, shows the uh, worldwide appeal of Sherlock Holmes. Has anybody else got any questions for Howard? Any pick his brains about actors you may have heard about or uh, know more about? Yeah, if you can stump him with one, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> I'm sure it's very difficult to do the stump you, Howard. No, I, I get stuff all the time. Identify this picture or this clip, and it's like, not too many have stumped me, but I, I can generally research and find the answer and relative, through all my connections around the world within a relatively short time. But it looks in part like SMU discovered a um, in their collection of films, Southern Medicine University in Dallas, which is where I am right now, they found asylum film and they didn't know the name, but there's a picture which gives an actor's name and gives a name, but it's not the name of the film, which they didn't realize. They thought it was, but it's in the middle of the film. So it's not the opening card. And I've done a lot of work on silent film ones and uh, they wanted out of what the name of the film was. And I tracked a ton of stuff and I believe it's Sherlock Groans is probably the name but I don't have that in definitive in any of the magazines or uh, I search or anything or newspapers yet. I haven't the name, but I know the actor. I know what the film is and stuff. And it's, in, it's actually now on YouTube. So it's interesting. Uh, can I just ask um, Bill sure. uh, um, to have a uh, fascinating presentation. The Thank you. Australia pioneered silent movies. So the first silent movie was made in Australia on Ned Kelly. Was he Australia equally a pioneer in Sherlock Holmes movies? I, I don't have him listed as any Sherlock Holmes movies tonight. In Australia, we call, there's a lot of information now you can search in um, the newspapers there. And I, I have no mention of uh, silent films of Sherlock Holmes from there. I mean, the earliest thing I have is actually just that uh, it's a mutoscope. Sherlock Baffled in 1900, which was made in, I believe, in Buffalo, New York. It might have been New York City. But it was just a mutoscope, one of the things you crank and watch and put together in a 30-second film later on. So really, 1905, you know, Sherlock, um, the, the adventure of Sherlock Holmes with uh, Gilbert M. Anderson, it's really the first one, which is one of my papers I wrote, which started me out writing papers because I was an autograph collector. And... You know, I read an article in the, um, the journal, the Baker Street Journal by Les Klinger. And the article said that he had spoke to uh, Pointer, who uh, Michael Pointer, who wrote the first reference book on films and stuff. And when he had talked to Pointer, Pointer told him he made a mistake listing Mar Maurice Costello as the, he got it from an unreliable source in France, that Maurice Costello was the first Sherlock Holmes in film. And when he put that in his book, every book since then has copied that Maurice Costello was because they can't look up silent films that well. Now I can research them. And my first paper was actually because I wanted, I had bought on eBay an autographed picture and had it framed on my wall along with Gillette, all the big you know, hundreds of them. And uh, now I'm reading this article and he wrote the article not to disprove, uh, he, it was a humorous article. His point was, well, it wasn't Maurice Costello. It was probably the real Sherlock Holmes because that's the date of the hiatus. And he came to America and made the film. And that was his joke. And I liked that. That was funny, but it set me off like, what? 
you know, Maurice Costello's not it. I got this stupid autograph. I'm like, wait a minute. So I started to research that real heavy and ended up writing a huge paper on, uh, uh, I had to use Holmes' own Matthews to find all the actors in the company, eliminate who plays what kind of parts, who did it. And uh, eventually I was able to prove. And then when more stuff came out, I found photos and stuff. And uh, I was able to prove that it was Maury, um, Gilbert and Am Anderson, who was actually only famous as Bronco Billy. He was the first cowboy of films and really famous. But that was one of his early projects with uh, Vitagraph, and he was only there for a year. So it was, it, I love that paper. It's a lot of fun. So that's another one if you want, I got available. So that's right. a good question. Thank you, Alan. So, but if you do you discover more, more on a silent film in uh, Australia, I'd love to hear it. But that, none of my research has come to any clues leading towards that. So I can't help you on that. Well, I've, I've, I've put a few feelers in. There's an organisation that's here called Australia's Silent Film Festival, and I talk with them quite a bit. And I've asked them to give me any information they may have about early uh, Sherlock Holmes films. I put them up, possibly come across. So they're, they're my they're my spies at the moment, keeping an eye on that for me. The trouble with the uh, Silent Film Festivals is they contact me with the questions. <laughs> <laughs> they can't supply me with answers when I write them. They they ask me, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> so that's it. Good luck with that one. I hope you will turn one. up something. Yeah. Oh, well, there's enough researchable sites now that if you have uh, just the little bits of clues, you, can, you might be able to find something. But he has a director's name, for example, and you can you got to do searches and put Sherlock in that director's name, and maybe just maybe you'll come up with something. I hope so. I like new finds all the time. Fingers crossed. May, may I ask a question, Bill? Is that Okay. Should go ahead, Paul. Th th thanks, Howard. Uh, fascinating. Um, did of any of these people or the producers, or etc., run into legal copyright battles? Um, that have you, oh, have you uh, yeah. <laughs> come across <laughs> that at all? <laughs> oh yeah. The the Doyle estate has been a you know, I mean Doyle himself and Gillette. You know they sued. Uh, for example, there was uh, another play on Broadway at the same time as Gillette's, which was, um, I'm blank on its name right now, but it was assigned at a four, and I can't think of the actor's name, but it was on Broadway at the same time, and, and this play was down the street from Gillette's play, and they put this giant Sherlock Holmes, and in small letters under it, the sign of the four, and Froman and Gillette and Doyle all had a fit and sued them, you know, and they, they won, they had to change the the sign title, you know, like that. And of course, Doyle's kids wanted, you know, they were money hungry spenders and they they wouldn't let a million of projects be done. And the Doyle estate today, even with the stuff uncopyrighted with Les Klinger's suit and a lot of stuff other than the last 12 stories. Um, yeah, and Nola Holmes got sued, for example. Mm -hmm. And it's a case of, uh, you know, well, you know you're right, and you're not using a copyrighted story, but they use the angle like, oh, they made it a sympathetic Holmes. He wasn't sympathetic in the early stories, you know, there's a total yeah. bull crap. But they sue him, and a lot of these film companies have already got so much tied in production, they'll just send him a payment. It's like, it's like blackmail, you know? Yeah. And until the last 12 stories come out, they'll still be trying to sue people, you know, the, the Conan Doyle estate. So yeah, yeah it's prevented a lot. That's why you see so many productions. When when I my section on uh, silent films comes out, uh, you'll see most people list there was only hundred silent films, maybe this and that, and they lost and blah blah blah. Well, so many had to change the name because of copyrights. That I have over three hundred silent films that are Sherlock Holmes. So, but most of them are changed for the exact reason you said. Yeah. Thanks. Like, Thank you. Yeah. yeah, Treville, for example, in France, that was paid and proved by Doyle, but none of the others, you know. And some of the foreign got away with it because they just don't pay the copyright. They just, but uh, the early foreign films like uh, Denmark had a lot, for example. So, good question, though. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Paul, for that. Anybody else got any uh, questions for Howard? Yeah, ready. All right. Thank you. How we might let you go to bed. It's kind of quite late in the night for you. So uh... now I'm finally wide awake. <laughs> <laughs> Thank 
you very much for your presentation. It was fantastic, full of detail, and you're a, you're a mine of information, that's for sure. So, well, um, I enjoyed your group asking me, and it was fun talking with them. I'm glad to meet them. Great. <laughs> well, we might get you on again sometime in the, in the years to come. My college roommate, my ex-college roommate, now, lives in Sydney, Australia, so. Okay. I have a friend there. That, that's good. And of course, Bill, I hit you up with uh, Australian questions every now and then too. Yep, happy to help any way I can. Yeah. yeah, I'll pitch in and uh, make some get some detail if I can for you. Oh, great. All right, I'll play the floor open to everybody. Anybody got anything they want to let us know about or talk to us about? Ask us questions. I know it's very early in the morning for Marketa and uh, Alice, so uh, maybe uh, we can uh, call it quits pretty soon. Paul, you want to say hello to Kerry, I think. He's down the oh, I did, yes. <laughs> yeah, Kerry. <laughs> you, I think I saw him there somewhere. <laughs> he's there. Yeah. Oh, he's Lisa. Kerry is Lisa. Le yes, I thought I gathered that, yeah. <laughs> G'day, Kerry. Haven't seen you for 20 years. <laughs> All right, thanks all. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're recording this, and the, once it's been edited down, we'll put up on YouTube and advise everybody when it's available for viewing. If anybody does not want to be in the recording, please let me know. We'll try and edit, edit you out. But um, oh, I don't want to be in it, Bill. I don't want. No, I'm just kidding. Wait, it's too late, Howard. You, you're the star. You no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, Doug, no. thanks to Doug for doing the recording and editing of that. So he'll be working away on that in the coming days. Thanks all. Um, there's no word yet on whether we'll get in together in, in a face-to-face -face meeting for quite a while. It's uh, unlike you in the USA, Howard, uh, our vaccination program is dragging the train out here somewhat. So um, it's taking, oh. a while, taking a while to get uh, everybody up, up, to, up to the vaccinations who want to get it. Uh, the USA is dragging too because we've got so many dummies who won't get it, you know, like more than half. So it, uh, I think you're dummies of the government here rather than the people. But uh, 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 half the people, uh, I have conspiracy theories and everything. Uh, they think there's magnets in it. Uh, that's all. It, it's cuckoo. It's, I, it's crazy. I love the idea of some of the states in the USA are offering uh, beer as an uh, incentive to go get the vaccination. That's a good idea. I'm sure that don't work as well as cash. Plan. Maybe they're holding out for cash. Yeah. All right. All right, thanks, well, to, thanks everybody. It's been fabulous to see you all. Your, your partition based participation has been great. Um, and we'll be in touch about uh, any further Zoom meetings, of course, or face-to-face uh, -face meetings later in the year. But uh, for now, goodbye and thank you all.